Social issues for people with ASD. So the guiding metaphor for this section is basically that a person with ASD has the same hardware, they have a human brain, uh, but the software or their ways of thinking that they're applying to that brain differ significantly from a neurotypical person, and this causes eventually structural changes within the brain itself, and a lack of connectivity and often misunderstandings between different sections of the brain. And this is essentially caused by are they developmentally delayed in a number of ways, or they develop differently, is most clearly shown when they do a lot more repetitive play and and very rarely get towards creative play as developing children. And what this means is essentially that uh, if you're reusing the same neural networks over and over again, uh, then you'll have a brain that works very differently to a person who is uh, doing what young children do, which is a range of creative play and innovating and learning new words and then dropping them and picking up new ling linguistic forms and then dropping them as they develop. So I'll be comparing a fair bit to normal development in this section. Uh, and it's important to know for a person with ASD, their development uh, becomes abnormal from about the age of three on where and prior to that they're either just hitting their developmental milestones or they're just hitting the very end of those developmental milestones so just making them in time but from three onwards uh, their development progress is then atypical. So if you think of a baby after you know, the first couple of months of birth the first thing that they do is basically they're seeking out eye contact and they're seeking out and recognizing faces. From the age of three onwards uh, a child with ASD won't do this in the same way. So a child with ASD is more likely to fixate on an innate object, something hanging from the roof or a spot of light on the wall or something different to the normal faces and the eye contact that most babies seek out. So earlier this year I was walking with a female student through the yard and from about 500 metres away, a person I could barely see, uh, this student said that that girl over there is staring at me. And this really drew home to me just how strong social cues are and how we as humans are scanning the environment for social cues more than anything else. And that these social social interactions and social in, socially important things really pop out of an environment even when they're a great distance away. So if you just quickly think to yourself, how did you learn to interact socially? How did you learn the social rules? Uh, it's probably really quite difficult to pinpoint down. And the main thing is that basically you never actually actively had to seek it out except for perhaps you know occasional mistakes where you'd misstep because you were over applying a rule or under applying a rule or something like that just innately in whatever way you learnt the social rules and you learnt how to make social interactions with people effective and enjoyable so the key and most core element of social interactions is joint attention so if you think of a young baby again the first thing that they do once they realize they can recognize faces is that they will look at things and point at things and you as a dutiful parent or nearby adult will also follow their eye line and also their finger. And then you will both have the shared experience of looking at the same thing together. And of course, this, this is how you develop the most basic forms of play. And then you get increasingly complicated and building language from there. So once you can basically start to physically hand something to someone, they can start to interpret why you're handing it to them. Are they saying this is funny? Are they saying this is horrible? Are they saying this is beautiful? And that's kind of the core concept or the core foundational stone of communication to people looking at the same thing and for a person with ASD this doesn't develop at the same rate as it does for neurotypical children. So for a person with ASD joint attention is possible uh, but it's tiring in the same way that reading or decoding language is tiring for a dyslexic person. So they can do it uh, but you need to sort of build up their ability to do so and it will be tiring and draining and they'll need little breakout sessions or times to relax and unwind and have their own time to support that sort of learning. So again, I think the best way to explain the social dilemmas for an ASD person are to begin very young with the developmental stages. And now we're gonna look briefly at play. So basically there are five stages of a developmental play. Uh, firstly, solitary, then parallel, then onlooker, then associative, and then reciprocal. So I'll explain sort of those in a brief little explanation just to show you uh, what they mean. And then the core concept, which is where ASD people tend to stop or struggle to develop further, uh, will be explained. So solitary play is one child playing by themselves. There's a big distinction between imaginative and non-imaginative solitary play. Uh, but the core thing is that their child is by themselves. Second is parallel. So this might be a creche type setting or a kindergarten type setting. You've got two babies side by side. Uh, their play isn't interacting, but they are quite aware of each other uh, and they're aware that they're side by side. Onlooker play is, probably comes in about a year, a year and a half, and that's when a child will actually, you'll see them in the playground sort of standing on the outskirts. They're watching other people play and they're picking up new language and they're interacting in that way. So associative play is where they are together. 
Um, they're not entirely reliant on their on the other people that they're playing with, uh, but it is much clearly, much more clearly interactive and engaging. So they might be checking, they might do a little bit of onlooker, but then they might even ask questions and they're interacting in that way. Final stage is reciprocal play. So in this, they're actually relying on one another to play a game. So if you think of, you know, following the most basic rules of a card game or a board game, that's reciprocal. If the other person wasn't there, there, was no, there is no game taking place. So they are actually relying on each other, whereas associative, they can dip in and out of relying on one another. For reciprocal, they're sort of interwoven. In terms of ASD, uh, it's quite often difficult to pick up social issues in the classroom because you're the teacher and the person with ASD might quite comfortably interact with you. But once you get out into the schoolyard, it may, may become quite clear that the person with ASD lacks this, the socialization that you thought that they were having just because they were in a class where they're sort of forced into proximity with other students uh, and they're working alongside students. You might put them in a group and they're busily working and so you presume that they're being social and interacting with their peers. Uh, but it becomes a lot more stark and obvious to notice any social issues in the yard where things are less structured, less formalized, and there's not as many rules in place.